Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we have a program on Hughes Aircraft History. We're at the historical Culver City facility for a retiree's reception in the building where the Spruce Goose was built. We'll be interviewing some of the Hughes retirees who helped create the magic that was Hughes Aircraft. For today's segment, I've invited Buzz Elliott to be a guest interviewer. I'm here with George Merritt, uh, a uh, retired uh, Hughes employee, and uh, during his time uh, at Hughes, he was involved in the flight test program and also in uh, marketing uh, for a while with uh, radars. He uh, has a vast amount of experience flying aircraft, both uh, military and uh, in the civilian world, and we're uh, here today to, to talk to him a little bit about his experience both before and after uh, uh, his, his time in the military and in uh, civilian flight. Uh, George, I also might mention, is an author of the book Howard Hughes Aviator and was a technical consultant for uh, the Aviator movie that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, was uh, cast as uh, Howard Hughes. So uh, today, George, uh, welcome. We would like to get a little bit of an idea of uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, your experiences in uh, military flying, uh, what your history was that qualified you to become a uh, flight test pilot for Hughes Aircraft Company. I joined uh, Hughes Aircraft Company as an experimental test pilot in May of 1969. I had just returned from a combat tour in Vietnam. I flew 188 missions as a Sandy rescue pilot, uh, rescuing both uh, Air Force and Navy pilots that were shot down in uh, northern Laos and North Vietnam. Before that, I had gone through the Air Force test pilot school out at Edwards Air Force Base and then stayed at Edwards for three more years as a, as a test pilot. So when I joined Hughes Aircraft Company, I was fresh from the testing community, also had recent combat experience, had delivered weapons, and Hughes Aircraft Company, while it's an, it says aircraft in its name, it was really an electronics company, electronic weapons. And so the Hughes Aircraft Company was competing for contracts to build missiles, to build uh, radars, to build helmet-mounted sites, helmet-mounted displays, FLIRs, a whole variety of electronic weapon systems uh, for the military in competition with other companies like Raytheon, like Westinghouse, and, and other others. So um, I was offered a job and moved to Southern California. The facility that I would be flying and operating out of is right here at, at Culver City. We're presently in the cargo building it's where the flying boat was built. This uh, facility was here during my time period. And ironically, they were building helicopters for Hughes Helicopter. I think they were the little OH-6 helicopters. Uh, because I remember that uh, our facility for flying the military airplanes was down at the west end of the field. This is kind of mid midfield and just uh, to the east of us I think was the cafeteria and the credit union so whenever I uh, came down I always walked through the cargo building because all of these helicopters were being built and the war in Vietnam was still going on not for me but for for other people so I remember the uh, riveters and all of the activity going on it was just kind of fun to see uh, helicopters being built at any rate, I was hired as a, uh, as a test pilot. Uh, there were several programs going on and several potential really, really large programs uh, that were coming up. Uh, because I had flown the uh, Air Force F-4 Phantom out at Edwards, uh, the Hughes Aircraft Company had a program called Dynacords and it used uh, an F-4. And essentially what it was, was uh, there was a Westinghouse radar on the Air Force F-4 that would not work very good in looking down. And so Hughes engineers had modified uh, a radar so that it had better capabilities in looking down. And so uh, because I had flown the F-4, it was easy to get recurrent in that uh, aircraft to fly that, that program out of, out of here. Uh, the other one that they had is uh, Hughes Aircraft Company was working with the Navy on the AUG-9 radar 
and the AIM-54 missile, which initially was to go on the Grumman F-111B, uh, which was the compatriot of the Air Force F-111A. It was uh, Secretary McNamara's commonality, a uh, huge amount of commonality between the two airplanes, but it also meant that uh, there were a lot of compromises made. Uh, the Air Force continued with the F-111A. I had flown the F-111A out at Edwards as a test pilot. Now Hughes Aircraft Company had two F-111Bs. Actually, they had had three, but in September of 1958, uh, they had an accident out off of uh, the Santa Barbara Channel and lost an airplane and a pilot and the RIO was killed. So that was a, a, a pretty dreadful situation that had happened for the airplane uh, and the program, but it also meant they had an opening because uh, they wanted to continue flying the airplane. So because, even though I did not have a Navy background, had an Air Force background, I was on a Navy program flying the F-111B out of this Culver City facility. Uh, and there, there were quite a bit of similarities. They only built seven of these airplanes and several Grumman people were killed. It was, uh, it was a bad airplane. The Navy was wise in dropping out. So um, what kind of a facility did we have here? By military standards, it was extremely marginal, very, very marginal. Uh, the runway was 8,200 feet long, but only 75 feet wide. And military standards are usually at least a minimum of 150 feet wide. This was half, half of that. Uh, the other thing that Howard Hughes had continued to want to have the land uh, uh, taxed as agricultural. So there were bean fields around the field, which attracted varmints, which attracted birds, and so hitting birds on takeoff and landing was an everyday occurrence. Matter of fact, I remember even the control tower operator used to say that there's a swarm of starlings and where they were, and you'd kind of wait until maybe they had moved north of Jefferson or moved some other place before you started the takeoff roll. Uh, the other thing about the, uh, about the airfield is that you, uh, you have the college, Loyola, is sitting up on the bluff. And of course, we're making a lot of noise in these afterburner type of fighters. So uh, the, the school was not very happy with us uh, on that. Plus, the bluff prevented this from ever being an IFR airport. I mean, instrument flight rules. It was a day VFR. We could not land airplanes here at night. We could not come in under IFR conditions. We could depart IFR. Uh, we were also right in between the airport traffic area of Santa Monica. Uh, to the north and LAX to the south. So it was a lot of flying activity going on of, of airplanes and there were mid-air collisions. Uh, um, several occurred during my time period to hear. I'd hear somebody say an airplane went down. And I remember running out one time, looking to the north and seeing the smoke coming up from uh, just north of Jefferson. Uh, the other thing that the military did not like was the close proximity of buildings to the runway. That uh, was inside of their limits. So we flew out of here with a lot of operational uh, discrepancies. Uh, I think they had, uh, what would you call it, uh, uh, we had uh, amendments to the, the contracts to be able to continue uh, flying out of here. Uh, it, was, it was not uh, an easy place to get in and, and out of. Uh, of course, we made a heck of a lot of noise, even, even for the people who were working here. Uh, when you took off in Afterburner in the F-111, uh, not much work got done during that time period, that's for sure, because that thing really, uh, it would burn 50,000 pounds per hour per engine on takeoff. It really, it really sucked the, the fuel out. So uh, those were the initial programs that, that I was ass assigned to. George, uh, after you got out of the military in 1969 and uh, came to work at Hughes, uh, that was really a, uh, uh, the Cold War was in full bloom. Uh, uh, Vietnam was still raging. Uh, a lot of uh, military systems were being uh, developed. And uh, we, uh, 
we're working in uh, with uh, in competition with a lot of other contractors in the uh, uh, Southern California area, which was a real mecca for uh, aerospace uh, at that time. And of course, we competed with people on the East Coast and all. But uh, I guess the uh, the question that would be interesting to hear about would be your your uh, uh, perceptions of how. Uh, what programs were involved at that time that were significant, as well as uh, how did, uh, was it like flying in and out of the, uh, the Culver City airstrip? And uh, when you were working on these programs, uh, how did engineering and flight test work together to, uh, to pull all of this together? When I joined uh, Hughes Aircraft Company, they were kind of going through a big transition of pilots. Up until my time period, most of the test pilots had been Howard, hired by Howard Hughes at the end of the war. They typically were had combat ex experience at that time period, and it was uh, they flew both uh, what we called experimental, which was testing Hughes equipment, but they also flew uh, transportation, which meant that Howard owned airplanes, and he flew some of them. These pilots also flew Howard around, so they, they, they did both. Uh, by my time period, that had split up and was a transportation department, and there was an experimental. I was in the experimental, so primarily I, I flew the uh, test missions. I flew a couple of times as co-pilot when they needed it on a uh, multi-engine airplane when they were taking Hughes employees someplace, but my primary duty was uh, in the testing. Um, one of the uh, more remarkable persons that uh, actually ran the flight test division was a guy by the name of Bob DeHaven. And he had uh, learned to fly during World War II, flew P-40s, P-38s, had shot down 14 Japanese airplanes in World War II. So he was a double ace, and he was in charge of the flight test division. He had been hired in 1948 after he had been a bit part in a couple of movies. And matter of fact, he married Connie Haynes, who was a big singer of, uh, of the 40s and sang for uh, Frank Sinatra and Jimmy Dorsey and, and some of that. Uh, some of the other test pilots had married Hollywood uh, starlets. So similar to How Howard Hughes, uh, there was still kind of this connection between show business and flight test and, and airplanes. So it was uh, an, an interesting time period. The uh, Bob DeHaven now was manager of flight test and was not doing uh, any actual flying of the test missions, but he was in charge of the pilots, the mechanics that maintained the aer airplane. Um, he was in charge of the instrumentation, the design of all of the instrumentation that went on board our airplanes. Uh, he was responsible to the government because these were government-owned airplanes that were bailed to Hughes Aircraft Company for the strict purpose of testing their equipment and in many cases going into competition to try and win major, major uh, competition. So the next one during my time period that was on the horizon was the F-15 radar. The Air Force was going to replace their F-4s with the F-15 Eagle. The competition had already chosen McDonnell Douglas to build the F-15. And there was Westinghouse and Hughes Aircraft Company that were going to be in competition for the, for the radar. So the plan was, and this had occurred before I arrived, uh, was that uh, a, a WB-66D, Douglas B-66 aircraft twin-engine bomber that were presently being used for electronic countermeasures over Vietnam would be bailed to Hughes Aircraft and another one would be bailed to Westinghouse in Baltimore. We would have about the better part of a year to modify the airplane and do the initial flight tests out of Culver City here, and then we would take the airplane back to St. Louis in the summer of 1970 for a fly-off competition. Winner take all. Whoever wins that built all of the radars for the F-15. Initially it would be some 700 F-15s for the United States Air Force. Later it turned out to be Saudi Arabia, Japan, maybe Israel, several countries were going to buy this. So these are multi-billion dollar programs and you got one airplane 
and one pilot and a lot of testing to do. We also, I should add, is we had at least Air Force T-33 that we used as a target. And it was a, a small airplane and so it was a small target. It was kind of the spec target that everything was compared to. Uh, head on, it had a very small profile. And so um, the B-66 uh, that was to be used on that program was flown in here for by an Air Force crew. And the airplane then was taken in the hangar, taken all apart, and they start modifying it with all of the electronic racks and all of the equipment that, that would be needed for testing. And, then, and Hughes actually built, Hughes Aircraft built two of what was called an engineering model radars. These weighed, I'm thinking around 800 pounds, 900,000 pounds, something like that. One that they kept up in the roof house and one that we had in the airplane with all of the parts interchangeable. So the roof house was active in, in working the bugs out of the radar day and night, I think many even weekends. And then we would swap uh, things around. So uh, I had to get checked out in the B-66, so I went uh, sent back to Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina. And I went through a ground school simulator and flying with eight Air Force pilots who were getting ready to go to Vietnam and I was thankful that I wasn't on my way back to Vietnam. They were so I didn't have to go through the extra training that involved heading off to war. I'd already been involved with the war but then I came back to be the primary pilot to uh, fly that. Now I might add that we were flying a multitude of airplanes. I was continuing to fly the F-111B, continuing to fly the F-4. We also had another program that was starting to brew up and it had to do with the Air Force Maverick missile. It was the AGM-65 I think was what it was. It was being conducted uh, the program out of the Missile Systems Group at Canoga Park. Missiles would actually eventually be built in Tucson but they were installed on our airplanes and we did the preliminary uh, flight test out of Culver City here, the Culver City runway. And typically for a Navy program, uh, we'd take off from Culver City and go in the outer sea test range off of Point Magoo and uh, fly our missions against drones and against other manned airplanes. Uh, for the Navy program. For the Air Force programs, we'd head up north to Edwards Air Force Base, and that's where we conducted our test missions. So no con uh, missions were actually conducted over Los Angeles. Uh, they were all in restricted areas. So it, it, it was some distance to get out there and to get, and to, uh, and to get back. And we always had to think of the alternate. If the fog and uh, came in here, then we couldn't get back in, so we're going to have to land at a Navy base with a Navy airplane, Air Force base, with them, and then get our mechanics, who were civilians, uh, practically all of them had a military background and were well trained and were the cream of the crop. I, I guess I should add that they were really, really good mechanics. The bad thing from our perspective is that they were union, and so the restrictions that management had in keeping overtime balanced and trips balanced and seniority was just a literal nightmare compared with what it was in, in, the, in the military. Um, and uh, I guess I should also add that uh, all of these programs had deadlines and they had some future event that was going to be so critical. And needless to say, the equipment many times did not work and we'd have to come back and land and they'd start working on it and guess what? Next Saturday and next Sunday it's going to be ready to fly and we need a pilot to fly it and a pilot to fly the target. And so we practically flew every weekend for quite some time uh, because again we only had about four pilots and we had a variety of programs. So there was also lulls. There would be months that go by and nothing would happen. Uh, until they got the equipment ready to, to go again. So it was kind of a feast and famine. I know we always kidded as pilots that there were times they could have gotten by with two pilots and probably times they, we needed six. Uh, but we balanced it out by um, go, going back and forth and flying on, on, uh, on weekends. So uh, I guess it was also quite exciting to be part of the competition. Uh, because of these deadlines and because uh, so much was writing on it, we're talking about in some cases probably billions of dollars 
that, that's, that's big money even now, let alone back in that time period. And the competition was fierce, and, but we had always felt we had uh, the best engineers, uh, we put the best teams together, they were usually uh, selected, and, and it was kind of interesting for me because um, having come from combat in Vietnam, I was kind of used to this acceleration of things are so critical, it's got to be done today. Well, that's the way it is in combat, every day is important. Uh, if you let down at all and get hacked, then it, the war may be over for you. You're either killed or captured. Uh, this was kind of the same way, as uh, this flight is so critical and this is so important that uh, we got to get the results, we got to win the contract. George, could you uh, please tell us uh, what uh, aircraft you were checked out in at the Culver City site and uh, what kind of programs uh, were they supporting? Well, the uh, most interesting program, of course, for me as a former Air Force pilot was the competition for the radar for the Air Force's F-15 Eagle program. That uh, radar was installed in a B-66, a twin-engine bomber, and remember, I'm a single-engine fighter pilot now flying a bomber airplane. And it was not a very good airplane. It was 75,000 pounds, carried five crew members. Three of us sat up in front in upward ejection seats. Two were in the back in downward ejection seats. And I'm the only one that is really officially kind of a crew member, has been through um, survival schools and all that. The rest of these are Hughes engineers that it's my responsibility to train them on the use of an ejection seat, parachutes, and all the uh, survival aspects of that, which was uh, not something that I that thought I had signed up for, but it's something that, that, uh, that we did. So we flew the B-66 out of here for about Oh, six months or so before we took it back to St. Louis. Uh, had a fly-off competition. Uh, we had a tough time back there. Everything kind of went wrong with the airplane and the radar, but we did get the data. And lo and behold, a couple months later, we were awarded the F-15 uh, contract. And I might add, even now, 2011, F-15s are still flying with modified Hughes uh, radars. So that has gone on for, what, 41 years since we had the fly-off competition. H uh, Hughes, which is now Raytheon, is still making money on that. So it was a very, very successful uh, program. I was kind of sad to see the airplane go. I ended up uh, years later seeing it in Davis Month and when I ferried another airplane back there. So there it had sat for a while and I'm sure it's been smashed down since then. At any rate, that was a very uh, interesting program, a very lucrative uh, program for us. My dad had I, uh, talked a little bit about the Maverick uh, program. It's an air to ground, TV guided, um, uh, weapon. So this is part of the launch and leave concept. Instead of having to guide weapons all the way to impact, uh, you can lock on to something and away it goes. So uh, we were trying to get much improved accuracy from what we had and reliability from the previous generation of equipment. And we were very good at that. And I might add that through my career here of, of flying and the programs that we won, we're in the backdrop of the Cold War. But because the Cold War never went hot, we ended up winning that just about the time I retired, 1989. A lot of this equipment was has been used in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and performing quite well there too. Now we really know that the reliability is there and the accuracy is there and when you fire a Hughes missile or use Hughes equipment, it's gonna work. Uh, another interesting program had to do with flying the Navy A3A Sky Warrior. Uh, it was a very early airplane that uh, had been built by Douglas Aircraft Company and was on a program called MMR, Multi-Mission Radar. It's a Navy program. I started flying the A3 after uh, the F-15 program had been completed and the B-66 went back to St. Louis. 
So it was an interesting airplane for me because it was very similar to the B-66, except no ejection seats, just parachutes. What was interesting about this airplane, I think in particular, was that all of the electronics equipment, most of the electronics equipment, and certainly all of the Hughes engineers that were part of the program, were in the Bombay. The Bombay uh, doors were, were sealed, and the electronic racks and the seats were put in there. There were no windows. It smelled of gasoline back there. It was very disorienting because if I go into a bank, uh, the guys in the back can't see out to see what, uh, what, it, what it looks like. And we were making these radar strip maps from up around Fillmore, let's say 50 miles northwest of here, all the way down to San Diego and it was synthetic aperture radar. It was a new use for radar that was different than pointing, locking on, and launching a missile. So we made these, uh, these uh, strip maps uh, and, and it really turned out to be uh, quite successful. However, it was low funding, the airplane was pretty old, and so eventually the program was over and I ferried the airplane uh, back to uh, Davis Monthan in the summer of 1975. I would see the engineers from time to time when we were at the plant and they were all kind of disappointed that the program didn't continue on. However, as time went on, I began to get indications that something else was going on. They had found somebody for their equipment. And it turns out the Air Force was interested in this for the stealth bomber. And so lo and behold, the, the genesis that we had in the early days was now created into something that was absolutely a world-class radar uh, that was that had its start right here at Culver City back in the late 60s and, and early 70s. So it was really neat to see that uh, that technology uh, continued on and uh, became as successful as it was. As time went on, I guess another major program we had here that uh, came up in the mid-70s was the competition for the F-16 radar. Now the Air Force was going to, after the F-15, was going to buy the F-16, and we were in competition with Westinghouse again for, uh, for that radar. So again, the Air Force bailed an F-4 to us, in this case an F-4D. We modified it. Uh, we put our radar in it and again flew out of, out of Culver City going up to the Edwards uh, restricted area and flying missions against our T-33. And all of the problems that we had had from the previous F-15 radar, we doubled up on this. We put a lot more people, a lot more energy, the, strictly the top people, and we had a dynamite radar when I flew the airplane, the F-4 back now. In this case, the, uh, the ones that are going to make the decision on the radar is General Dynamics which was located at Fort Worth, Carswell Air Force Base, and the Air Force. So we ferried the air, I ferried the airplane back there and we went through another competition that lasted, this case, about two months. And we really, really had a good, good radar. We even had some ground map capability, which we were told not to show to anybody because it wasn't part of the competition. And it might affect uh, some people thinking, wow, you guys really have something. At any rate, um, John Richardson, the senior vice president of the company, came back as, as, as Bob DeHaven, the ace, came back. A, a whole load of Fuse executives come floating through trying to get a sense as to how this program was going and what it would take to put us in the winner's circle. As it turned out, we got um, outbid by about 25%, meaning that Westinghouse bid 25% less for this entire contract than we did. So we lost that one. We didn't lose it on technology. We didn't lose it on performance. We lost it on, on cost. And it was too bad because literally thousands of F-16s have been built. Uh, and it's been a very successful program for the Air Force, and we lost that one. But right over the horizon, as was always the case, was another program. Now the Navy was interested in a radar for their F-18. So we did the same thing again. We got a Navy airplane, a Navy T-39D, twin-engine executive transport type airplane that's usually carried admirals across the country. And this time again, we gutted the inside of it out, put our electronic racks uh, in the back, 
and took the co-pilot's yoke out and instrumentation and we put in a radar and a hand control on the right hand side and we started flying against our T-33 but this time out at the Edwards complex. And this one was a good, a good operating uh, radar too. Uh, and it was, it was always interesting because so many dignitaries from the military, Navy people would come out to get a, a look at it and uh, and uh, of course it was always our position to represent the radar. The radar can't talk, uh, pilots can. So we were always kind of uh, a little bit more in the uh, front than some of the engineering people because we were wearing red, white, and blue flying suits and, and uh, patches and were spruced up and so it was, it was always fun. And lo and behold, I ran into, during my time period uh, with Hughes Aircraft Company, uh, Air Force test pilots, Navy test pilots that I had known from the past. So uh, it was always kind of a good connection. By then the war in Southeast Asia uh, was, was over. Um, we had a pretty steady pilot corps through all of that time period, pretty much the same, uh, same four, four guys. Uh, when the F-111B ended, uh, we had, had hired two pilots, Navy pilots that had gone through the Navy test pilot school to fly the F-14, which was now going to carry the AUG-9 radar and the uh, uh, Phoenix missile. Uh, but both of them left the company, and so I had flown the F-111B and knew the Navy program, so I was inserted as a F-14 pilot. And Hughes bailed, Hughes Aircraft bailed the number four and the number nine uh, airplane from uh, the Navy. Uh, but in this case, uh, the Navy did not feel it was safe to operate that new of an airplane uh, out of the Culver City facility. So uh, we moved uh, a good portion of our flight test activity to Point Magoo and all of the F-14s were maintained and operated out of Magoo. And we, and we in Hughes Aircraft Company probably flew the F-14 for about 10 years. Uh, so some people were moved around. Might also uh, then add on the Maverick program, uh, we did the initial testing on the Maverick AGM-65 missile out of Culver City, but the actual launches were to take place at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. So Hughes Aircraft Company, including our flight test division, set up a facility at uh, Holloman, and we sent one of our pilots out there full time to fly the A-7 and an F-4 to launch missiles out on their range, and another uh, pilot by the name of Bill Jessup, a test pilot, and I were his backup. So whenever he was ill or on vacation, uh, we flew back to Holloman and got to uh, fly there. So the point being is that there was a lot of activities, a lot of facilities. We were, our scoring was pretty good. We had a good batting average. We, we, uh, we did quite well. And even the Maverick program has continued. It's been modified over and over and over again and, and has turned out to be a super weapon. So uh, the equipment that was designed and tested here at Culver City turned out to be uh, very, very good for the U.S. military. George, uh, we're both uh, general aviation pilots now that we've uh, retired and uh, fly around the Los Angeles area. Uh, flying between Santa Monica and uh, Los Angeles International Airport, uh, the controlled airspace, uh, all the congestion of traffic uh, is pretty crazy right now. Um, however, back in those days, uh, uh, could you give us an idea of what it was like flying in and out, in and out of the Culver City site, uh, just from an aeronautical skills point of view for, as a pilot? It was a very unique experience to fly out of the Culver City Airport. I've kind of explained a little bit about uh, the fact that the runway is kind of short, kind of narrow, a lot of obstructions, but just the, uh, the airspace above it was also quite different. We were nestled in between the Los Angeles International Complex and Santa Monica, uh, with the runway fortunately was fairly parallel with LAX. So departure was not a problem. We could take off uh, IFR, uh, get airborne, gear up, flaps up, uh, make a slight right turn, go out over Marina del Rey and out into the Santa Monica Bay and then make, uh, make the turn. Coming back in was a little bit uh, sportier. It was uh, strictly day VFR. So typically what we do is come in at Point Doom 
uh, start dropping in altitude from 3,000, 2,000 down to around 1,500 feet and aim for an area just kind of between LAX and Marina Del Rey and then parallel Westchester as kind of a left downwind to runway 23. And at this point, we're above the LAX pattern. We're away from the light airplanes at uh, Santa Monica. Cross over the 405, get out a little bit further and start our left-hand base descending turn to come back in. There's actually a cemetery out there where Al Jolson was buried. So uh, that was always kind of the, the uh, Jolson turn, so to speak. What was interesting was that uh, the terrain on the east side of the freeway is quite a bit higher than the uh, the runway itself. So as you rolled out on final, uh, as you looked down below you, you felt low because the homes were right up uh, right up there. When you looked out at the runway, it was 75 feet wide, which is quite narrow. So you felt kind of high. So there was always kind of this depth perception that was a little strange as to how you how you felt. But the Navy came up with a um, uh, kind of a VASI type like the meatball and so that helped us get the glide path angle so really didn't uh, have a problem in uh, in putting it down uh, we did end up uh, having uh, no taxiways and no overrun so uh, we also got a chain barrier and so for the Navy airplanes that had a tail hook you could in fact lower the hook if you thought you were uh, going to overrun and uh, Bill Jessup did that in the A3 one time when he came back right after smoke in the cockpit after takeoff and got the airplane down. But it was, uh, it was kind of uh, sporty to get uh, things in and out, but what the heck, we were, we were pilots, we were all quite experienced, and so we did what we have to do to minimize noise and get the programs, get the data. That was always it, get the data. One way or another, get the data, win the program. We'd like to thank George uh, Merritt today for his time to uh, share with us the uh, experiences that he had back in the early days of the Culver City site and uh, flying at uh, Hughes Aircraft Company and flight test. Thank you, George. I'm here with Betty Roby. She's going to share some of the early history of Hughes Aircraft. Could you tell us what years you worked at Hughes Aircraft and what your role was? Well, I was there for a while in 1945. My husband was in the Navy at that time, and uh, I was only there, I don't think, quite a year until he came home, but um, there was no Building 1 at that time, and so the corporate offices were in Building 2, and I, I was a, a secretary, and uh, we did, uh, we, the flying boat was being built at that time, and we we did a weekly report on that. You came back to Hughes in 1949. Can you talk about what your assignment was at that time? I went it to the employment office, and um, they seemed real happy to see me. They liked the fact that I was from Iowa. I don't know why. They <laughs> anyway, uh, then they called Joe Petrali, and he came out there to the office, and I didn't know at that time that that was unusual for that to happen. But he talked to me and asked a little bit about my background and um, told me what I would be doing for him, that I couldn't be friendly and, and socialize with the girls up front, as they called it, because they didn't want me to uh, talk to anybody. And would I be all right out there at the flight. It wasn't really a flight line much. It was just part of Building 15. And Mr. Hughes' planes were there, and that's where the office was. And uh, so he said, would you be all right if you didn't have other girls to talk to and whatnot? And I said, well, I, I guess so. And uh, so he said, because Mr. Hughes came in quite often to the plant then because his planes were there, and they just couldn't have anybody that would be, because all the girls up front were wanting that job because they thought they'd be around Mr. Hughes and it would be exciting. But, uh, so he said, you look like a sensible girl. 
Well, I was pretty young then, and I don't know if that was good calling me sensible, but uh, anyway, it, it got me the job. And uh, so he asked if I knew anything about airplanes, and I said no, but why would I have to? And he agreed that that was okay. So, uh, and he wanted me to come to work right away, and then I started. And it, it was totally different from anything I had ever known, because it was just all men, and I was the only girl. Now, further down in the building, there was a, a, a place with supplies and things, but there were just no other girls. So I didn't have anybody to talk to. And uh, Mr. Hughes, we always knew when he was coming in. I think the first thing I had to learn was to know his voice when he called. And Joe had to be available. And he wanted me to call him Joe, by the way. I had never called a boss by his first name. But he said he would be more comfortable if, if I didn't mind doing that. Because it was a different setup out there where we were. So anyway, I started and I had my office and I knew Mr. Hughes' voice. And so it worked all right. And we usually knew when he was coming in. He came in uh, from Jefferson. Uh, and he'd come in the gate over there and then right across the, f f the flight, you know, well, the airport part. So then he would be there. And uh, then sometimes uh, he didn't even want me in there when he was talking. And then I, I just had to step out because he talked, you know, I guess they didn't want anything, you know, to get around. I understand there's a story in regards to the women's restroom and Howard Hughes. Would you please share that with us? Well, the men's restroom was just down the hall from my office, and he didn't like anybody talking to him, so he didn't like to go into the men's restroom. But he knew if I was at my desk, there was nobody in the ladies' room, and it was upstairs. And I thought it was kind of cute because he always took a magazine with him when he went upstairs. <laughs> and naturally, I mean, I just stayed put because he knew, as I say, when I was at my desk, he was safe up there with nobody. He didn't like anybody to approach him. And I, ne I never did, of course. If he asked me anything, why I answered. But we weren't friendly, warm and friendly. Just, just business-like. Can you talk a little bit about some of the celebrities that Hughes used to fly? Catherine Hepburn was, was one that he, he taught to fly, and he, so he was with her quite a bit. And he went with Ginger Rogers and Ava Gardner and, uh, oh, s several others, but I never heard that he had them planted all over Beverly Hills, like they said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was that bad, but um, of course there'd be pictures of different ones. And there was one incident that uh, I thought was amusing. Uh, he he had a lot of uh, I, several black Chevys, all looked alike, and they were cared for over in the garage there in Hughes. It's, it was up towards Gate Two, and uh, so. Ava Gardner had one of the cars, and I think she thought he had given it to her. But when he found out that she had stepped out on him or did something, he had the car picked up and took it back. So I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, because she, she, so he was that way. If he was through with one of them, why he would, you know, that was it. But he did like Katherine Hepburn, I think, about, about the best. Are there other celebrity stories that you'd like to add? Well, Terry Moore uh, was in his life longer than some of them were. But um, we never did know what happened. We would know when um, he picked her up with his plane and um, because the flight engineer he had would come into the office and talk. That's how I heard things. Anyway, she wrote a book and said that um, he used to come to her house in the middle of the night and just come in and, and spend the night sleeping on the couch, which I didn't believe for a minute. And I know one day the, the, the flight engineer came back from 
uh, having been gone with Mr. Hughes and Terry Moore. And he said, he doesn't want to take any more calls from that Coford gal. And that was her real name, Helen Coford, which I did know. And uh, so as far as I know, he never saw her again. But um, she did write that book, which I thought was a lot of them. I've got a lot of books with him in them, but I think they're all a lot of malarkey, but <laughs> kind of interesting, and I guess they sold. That that was what was important. So I don't think, and, until he met Jean Peters, and he did, uh, liked her immediately. And uh, so he didn't, she didn't pay any attention to him at first. But then finally she did, and they did get married, but it was all a big secret. Nobody knew where they went. It was in in Nevada. We, we did know that. And uh, she is the only one of the women that never mentioned him. She's never talked about him, and to this day. So that was kind of unusual because most of them liked the publicity of no one. And it, knowing Howard Hughes was something. Can you talk about Elizabeth Taylor? That wasn't really a romance because she, her mother came with her. She was very young then. She was just so beautiful, and I think he, you know, he liked that. And they flew to Palm Springs for a weekend. But uh, I don't think uh, that she was interested. She was very young, and... Howard Hughes, the name didn't mean that much to her, but uh, I guess that he did, you know, enjoyed that weekend. Of course, at the flight line, we, we knew when they came and went because the fellows had to get the plane ready for him, and so I always knew all those things, but just couldn't talk about them then. And I know that it came out about Elizabeth Taylor, and they came in and asked me, if I had said something, I said, of course not, but I said it was in the Times. Luella Parsons <laughs> had a column in the, I think in the Herald of her call, and she knew about it, so I, but heavens, that was general knowledge. But for myself, I knew that I didn't talk, but I knew those men did. You know, they were together out there in, in the big hangar, and they worked, went back and forth, and so... But I could never tell anything, and I just, I didn't. I understand there's a story about a halo and keeping the gentleman in line. The fellow thought that was pretty funny. And uh, the painter came over one day and painted this halo on, on the window outside. But where I sat at the desk, that halo was just right over my head. And everybody thought that was, was pretty funny. But it, it wasn't just that I just couldn't be too friendly with any particular one. It just wouldn't have been good, I don't think. Because out there when you're the only girl, I could have had a lot of attention. <laughs> and I never went out to lunch, you see, and because and, I stayed right there. But uh, it uh, everybody had a good laugh out of that halo. Because, but the, the f fellows were, they were always gentlemen. And I did all the paperwork, their vacations and sick leave and terminations. And so I got to know them all. And uh, it worked out really well because I wanted to be friendly, but just not too personal and friendly. So it worked. Well, they, they had to come in the office for the paperwork. And, uh, Every day I had to do a, a, a slip for the to go down to the flying boat. And I don't know why they had to do it every day, but they had to have one every day when they went down there, came back, because that was all kind of secretive. But they just uh, uh, w didn't get too friendly. I don't know how else to put it. I don't remember really any bad language, but I guess I would just look and... They they wouldn't. <laughs> I understand that Howard Hughes didn't use any office regularly. Can you talk about that? No, he, he didn't. Um, when he came in to our office, it was at the flight line. And uh, he he did had his meetings there. 
but he did have a room over the cafeteria that he used sometimes, and he had phones and there. But uh, there was a rumor around that he had an office in Building 1, but he never did. He didn't really even go in Building 1 very often. And uh, he went in, came in through Gate 2 when he was up there. And that, that's when they went to the garage sometimes for about one of his cars. And then he would go upstairs over the cafeteria. And he had a desk and phones there. But I, I guess you would, could call it an office. But he never did have one in Building 1 or Building 2 before there was Building 1. He just uh, didn't, as a rule, when he came into the plant, he came in from Jefferson and drove over the flight line and, and uh, into our office. And, but he never stayed too long, and he, he would go out where the planes were. He had two or three that he flew pretty regularly. He had favorites, and, and, uh, but they knew when he was coming and had everything set up for him because you had to have a crew get things ready. And each one of the planes that he flew had its own crew. And he, he knew them, and he was nice enough, but I don't think he was ever warm and friendly with with any of them, but he was always polite and nice. Did Howard Hughes do most of his own flying? Yeah, quite often he did. He had, uh, there, he, there was a B-26 that he flew quite a bit, and a Constellation, that was his favorite, I think. He flew, and he had, he liked the Sikorsky. He liked to fly that, but always someone with him who could take over if he if he wanted it. And uh, uh, my boss Joe Petrali knew him, I think, probably the best of all. And he wrote a book later on called "OK Howard," because that was it. When Mr. Hughes wanted something, "OK Howard." And he wanted it formal, like un, un, informal, like that. And uh, but one time um, he was gone three months with Joe, my boss, who wanted me to call him by his first name, by the way. And uh, his wife would be upset naturally. He, he couldn't call home. He, nobody was supposed to know where he was. And uh, so I think after that one three months trip. All of a sudden, Joe was gone, and I think that Mr. Hughes, if he, you know, if you did something he didn't like, and in his book, Joe told how Mr. Hughes would have have the hotel in in Vegas, and and Joe and the, the other flight engineer had their own, uh, not one of the big hotels, another one, and he told about that. And you were supposed to be in the room when, if Mr. Hughes called. Well, sometimes he wouldn't call for two days. And so it was very upsetting, and they couldn't call home. They weren't supposed to. So suddenly, Joe was gone, and I felt bad about that because I liked him very much, and I liked working for him. And I didn't know what was going to happen to me because I had been there a year at that time. And that's when um, General Shoup came in, and they brought people from the National Guard. So it, a lot was changed. Well, I didn't know what they w wanted to do about me, but um, I just had to wait. Well, I think the reason they wanted to keep me because I was the only one that knew anything there. <laughs> I knew everybody, and I knew the files. and so, so I think when they started, I don't know if they had intended to keep me, but they did at first. And then that worked out, so I was there. I didn't think I'd ever be there that long, 36 years. <laughs> and uh, I was at the flight line for 13 of it. And uh, so then, of course, I, I had to transfer. Well, Mr. Hughes wanted my boss at that time, John Seymour, to come to Vegas and and do the flight line there. He he was you know wanted a lot done there, so uh, John went and took a couple of people. Well, they weren't supposed to come back when they left like that. 
but they did get to come back when they finished in, in Vegas. And uh, so th then that was when I transferred to corporate, and that's where I was the, the rest of my employment. But I liked that, too. What was your assignment at corporate? I was uh, in what they call secretarial services, which I liked, and I didn't have any one particular boss. You just took whoever. Sometimes I was there for for three months with somebody. So John Richardson, I was with him about three months when his secretary had surgery. I was with Dr. Adler, Dr. Fred Adler, for for three months. So I really liked learning all the different places. I got to work for a lot of the different VPs and policy board members, and they were always nice. I liked some of them more than others, but a lot of times they wanted me to interview for a permanent job, but I would know if I would like it from being in their office. So I usually said, well, I'm happy where I am, and I just want to stay there, and which I did for years. And uh, it, uh, they were all real nice, and ex John Richardson was really a, a favorite. And uh, he was just a true gentleman, he really was. And uh, most of them had to work at it a little bit. <laughs> and, but he, he was just born that way, I think. And, uh, but they, they were all very nice and, and interesting to work for. Did you work with Cy Ramo and Dean Woolridge? No, I didn't work for either of them, but of course I knew they were there and what was going on. So it just depended who was gone where I was assigned. So I just never did work for either of them. Suddenly, they were gone, those two. And uh, that just, they didn't, they weren't happy there, I don't think, because they, they just didn't have the power and the prestige that they wanted because they could never get hold of Mr. Mr. Hughes. You just couldn't get him. I don't think he ever saw any of them. I don't think Highland ever saw him. But he had to talk to Highland once in a while when he came. But I think, I can't remember the sequence. Of, they had a couple of general managers and they, none of them stayed too long because of the, the circumstances. Which did you enjoy more, working at corporate or the flight line? I think the flight line, because I was more a part of things there. And I always, you know, you knew what was going on, and you didn't, just didn't talk about it. Were any of the Hughes aircraft test pilots lost? Well, Bart Warren is the only one that, that I know of, and that was just very sad for all of us. That's the first time that had happened. Thank you for joining Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.